Um, I'm Pamela Bhatti, and I'm a professor in uh, the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And um, my roots are actually in bioengineering. I had an undergraduate degree in bioengineering. And um, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a while uh, in the 90s, so or late, mid 80s, early 90s, so I guess I'm dating myself a bit. And um, after being in the biomedical engineering domain, I really felt that I wanted to build skill in electrical engineering. So I worked in industry uh, for some time before getting my PhD at Motorola, as well as a software startup. And um, I don't know about you, but for me, there's nothing like a software startup to motivate you to go get a PhD and do some things that are really active and engaging where you get to call the shots. Uh, so my PhD is in microelectromechanical systems, and basically it's, it's a field where you leverage the same technologies, uh, the same methods that you use to make integrated circuits, you can develop novel neural interface technologies. So that's the MEMS piece in my talk. And I'm very engaged in how we can take the MEMS and marry that to the neural interface as well as taking it one step further and trying to translate MEMS-based technologies into the clinical setting. So the two main applications that I'll talk about today are in the auditory and vestibular systems. And uh, for, I think I'm going to turn off the lights because I think the slides will show up a little bit better. Oh. Thanks for my helper here. Um, And feel free to stop me as I go, because this is an interesting crowd, because I'll probably give you maybe too much biology and maybe less of the engineering, uh, the electrical engineering piece. Um, so I'm also involved uh, over at Emory with the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. And it's really a, a nice way for those who are interested at Georgia Tech in looking at um, translating their work into the clinical setting and building skills. So there is a program where you can um, obtain a certificate, certifi uh, certificate in um, translational science. So I like to give a broad overview of what our lab does. So in the center here, our target is biomedical microsystems and neuromodulation devices. But that involves a whole host of more, I would say, engineering type technologies with the signal processing, circuit design, any implantable, di any implantable device. We have the wireless communication aspect, power, battery, all um, very, very critical components. And then we move over to the neural engineering side where we directly interface with neural tissue. And that involves uh, validating it in human models as well as testing it out as well as we can. And given my research focus, I do a lot of work with folks in uh, otolaryngology, speech and hearing, as well as uh, rehab medicine. So I'll start with the cochlear prosthesis work. And that I like to begin with because I think it's much easier to um, understand the interface and you probably all know that this is a technology that, that provides a sensation of sound to individuals who have severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss by directly stimulated, stimulating auditory nerves. Um, and there, this is a very prevalent device. Um, over 200,000 individuals are, have an implant worldwide. And the age range is very, very broad. Um, in the US, we implant children as young as nine months. And in other parts of the world, primarily Europe, they go, um, they'll implant as young as six months. And does anyone have an idea why we might, might want to implant very young children? Exactly. So. So they can learn to speak and establish the neural pathways, neuroplasticity. So we have a formative period in our first nine months. And if we don't engage the auditory system, we will lose or severely impact kind of the, the learning curve for language. And I work with a pediatric otolaryngologist over at Emory, and he's very, very pro um, implanting young children. 
uh, on the alternate side, there's folks in the deaf community who feel that we're forever changing them, and they don't believe that young children should be implanted. So it's a somewhat controversial issue. So uh, people with implants can do very, very well. Scores of nearly 100% speech recognition in quiet environments. And the challenge is in noisy settings uh, where, you, where you have multiple talkers coming at you from different positions in space. So there's a lot of effort on the signal processing side on how to improve implants in terms of capturing that auditory information. Becoming more and more common are bilateral implants um, where they're implanting both sides uh, for an individual. And I have a student who worked in my lab, and during the course of time in my lab, she went from one to two implants. And it was very interesting because she said this, when she got the second implant, they turned off the first to see how she could come up to speed. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, how these devices work. So stepping through the peripheral auditory system, we capture sound and we, <coughs> excuse me, conduct it to the middle ear where we have, oops, excuse me, where we have these three, ear, ear bo these three bones that form the um, os ossicular chain. And it's very fascinating because going from the eardrum to the inner ear, we've got a gain of 20 dB. So the ear is a beautiful filter. It's a beautiful mechanical filter, the middle ear. Once we go from the middle ear, we have an interesting challenge of matching uh, impedances because the middle ear, it, we have air, and the inner ear, where the cochlea resides, is filled with fluid. So it's a fluid-filled chamber, and traveling waves are set up in that chamber to depolarize nerve fibers. So looking more closely, so if you start here at the top, I've just taken a wedge out of the cochlea, and it's a multi-chamber device. So now let's take that wedge and look directly at the sensors that transduce mechanical energy to electrical energy, the hair cells here. And so this membrane, called the basilar membrane, is um, <clears throat> a very, very beautifully designed mechanical structure. So as the traveling waves move through the cochlea, this membrane moves up and down. And this motion then deflects uh, these outer hair cells, which then get conducted to the inner hair cells. So a series of electrochemical reactions occur that essentially translate these mechanical deflections into neural impulses carried through these peripheral processes of auditory nerve fibers. So the beauty in this, from an engineering standpoint, is if we take this membrane, and we look down on it, kind of looking down on a, a cinnamon bun or something, we see that its, its spiraling structure makes it sensitive in a frequency to place mapping. So we're more sensitive to uh, high frequencies here at the onset of the cochlea, as at the base of the cochlea as you come in. It's a stiffer membrane, and as you spiral towards the top of the cochlea, we're more sensitive to low frequencies. And so we can resolve to a first order, uh, to a first order we can resolve frequency to place. And this is pivotal in how a cochlear prosthesis functions. So sensory neural hearing loss, that's what I started with in terms of the candidates for cochlear implants, they have lost hair cell function. And so what I'm showing here is the top of a hair cell, the stereocilia on the hair cell, which deflect. And on the right-hand side, we have damaged hair cells. And on the left-hand side, we have uh, healthy hair cells. So there's a variety of reasons that can lead to hair cell loss or damage. Um, there can be a congenital defect, um, bacterial or viral infections, as well as acoustic trauma. So a lot of folks in the military have uh, sensory neural hearing loss because they've been on aircraft carriers, um, been exposed to IEDs. And so once we lose this ability to translate electrical to mechanical energy, we have hair cell, uh, we have hearing loss. 
So the nice, I guess, quote unquote, nice thing in this story is that while we have damage to hair cells, there is the ability to conduct electrical energy in the neural pathways. And so that's exactly what a cochlear implant does. The hair cells have been lost, but some loss of peripheral processes, but however, the cochlear nerve responds. And stepping through a cochlear prosthesis, if we start on the external portion, the job of uh, the signal processor, so we capture um, sound through a microphone, one or more. So the more advanced devices have multiple microphones so they can try to capture directional information. And those are translated, that information is translated into a series of voltages, essentially. And the external speech processor here makes, it really makes, what it does is it decides what information is important for speech or music. And that's a bit more advanced, but uh, it's very sophisticated. The first, um, well, currently the, the um, external speech processors have four DSP cores in them. So uh, a lot of engineering goes in the external speech processor. And these algorithms have evolved over time. And what I've shown here is the most commonly used uh, speech processing algorithm. And essentially, it distills out or it breaks frequency into 16 to 22 spectral bands. It filters the energy. So it filters those bands so it can pick out the energy because you have frequency. So you've taken our wealth of sound and picked out some frequencies. Now for each frequency, how do we stimulate the auditory nerve? So we pick out the energy of that signal. And that energy level is used to control the current level you, that uh, stimulates auditory nerve fibers. So if we, and you know, all that information or all those decisions are made externally and transmitted wirelessly to an implanted receiver stimulator here, um, shown as number five. So from that implanted receiver stimulator, pulses are delivered to auditory, uh, excuse me, to the cochlea, listed as number six here, where we've now taken frequency and we're hitting specific frequencies in the cochlea via the position of the electrodes on the electrode array. So looking a little more closely at the electrode array, this is <clears throat> excuse me, one method to target the vestibular nerve with as much spectral information as we can. So I'm a little, I, I cheat a little bit because I've done so much work on the periphery that ultimately it's a perception. So um, you need sound from as many sources as possible and how do you form that image centrally of the sound. So the goal here is, well, if we can improve the connection through the periphery, we can provide as much richness to the auditory system, and the auditory system can then provide the per perception of sound. So this is an older electrode array. The black are the um, electrodes, so a banded design, and it's inserted into the scala tympani, the bottom chamber here of the cochlea. Most electrodes arrays do not go all the way up to the, to the tip, to the apex, we have two and a half turns in the human cochlea. And while I've discussed the frequency to place mapping, that's how uh, the membrane is designed. But in terms of resolving those um, neurons that we can <coughs> stimulate, once we get up to the apex, we lose some of that. And that's one reason why cochlear implants, the electrode array does not go all the way to the top. The other reason is it's actually really hard to insert an electrode array and imagine that you need to insert this device however you want as less trauma as you can introduce into the cochlea because you really you're after maintaining this neural population because that's your conduit to the auditory system so let me play a few audio clips i, ho I hope this works well to give you um, a sense of how a cochlear implant works so what we've done is we've taken the uh, speech processing algorithm We've distilled out the uh, auditory signal, and then we've then remixed it 
as an auditory sound signal for us to appreciate uh, the stimulation aspect. Can you hear this? So these are sentences. I'll do two more. So How many of those sentences do you think you got? None? How m <laughs> so I was asking, how many of those sentences? Was it the volume level? Because I can replay them. No. So these are, these are sentences that are provided during speech recognition tests. And I was hoping. Often when individuals hear these, those of us who hear these, after hearing a few, we can recalibrate to this poorly spectral represented information and listen to the sentences. Um, but clearly, it's shifted in frequency from what it's, it's more robotic, a little bit uncomfortable. But what's impressive is that cochlear implants, cochlear implant users can make uh, this is an analogy, but they can make a, an electrical input provide this, uh, how do you say, image to them, an auditory image. So I'm going to move to music on this. Let me, hmm. this one I can play a little bit longer, so hopefully it'll have more of an impact. So this is just music. heard instrumental and voice, right? Okay. So let me play, if I can get my mouse here, let me play the song. courtesy of John Lennon. Um, we've got a long ways to go. We really have a long ways to go. And that's why I continue to do a lot of this research. While really good performers can gain a lot, we have a huge range of levels of perception. Cochlear implant users would like to hear much more of the world around them. And another piece that I didn't mention is that um, tonal languages. So Mandarin Chinese, Punjabi, there's a whole host of languages that need a different way of expressing, or they need, basically they need a different selection method for providing that spectral input to them. And so the work that I've been doing in my lab is doing for some time is enhancing that spectral content, and that's through electrode array development. So to a first order, and those who work, th there's always this big debate in, cochlear, in the cochlear implant world. So I get in a lot of trouble when I go on and on and on about the periphery and how if we improve the periphery, you know, that's all we need. That's not true. It's not true. We really need, there's a range of users, but for poor people who have a poor, um, I don't want to use the word poor, but they're more challenged 
with the cochlear implant, they can benefit from improving the periphery. There's individuals who do well with just eight channels, meaning that you don't need as many electrodes, you don't need as much, they don't need as much spectral content somehow, and they'll do fine. So when you have more electrodes, what you can get, what you can benefit from, and what this represents is how we um, engage. So here are, you know, hair cells, uh, the cell bodies, and we're trying to engage, we're trying to activate these neurons. So if we can refine that activation through more electrodes spaced more closely together, we can make the claim that we can, we can further restrict that spectral information. And this becomes important in music as well as hopefully um, looking towards timing because when I talked about bandpass filtering um, and doing the um, rectification, a lot of timing information is lost. So that's another critical piece. So if we can activate a more distinct neural segment of the neural population, for those who have a kind of a, a more sparse um, neural pattern, we have a better chance of activating them. Furthermore, as we age, we will, we will experience hair cell loss. So if you put, imagine you're um, implanting a one-year-old. You want that electrode array to be there for the duration. Now, if you can improve the signal processing, but then the electrode array can't match or cannot adapt to that signal processing, you're not going to help the individual. So that's another reason why we feel, and clinicians are really, really pro high channel count. I've never had a clinician tell me I want fewer electrodes. So another piece is that if you have more, imagine some of us have had EMAG, some of us haven't. Um, if you have more point sources, if you think about it that way, you have more ways to um, engage the neural pop population through more sophisticated stimulation paradigms. It's not just a single electrode, it's multi-electrode, so you can do um, wave shaping as well <coughs> and current steering. And what you're after is engaging the neural population. That's all that this is about. So this is some of the earlier work that I did um, at the University of Michigan when I pursued uh, my PhD degree. So I worked on the electrode array itself. And we built, this is size for a guinea pig, so we built a fully implantable system. And back here is a microcontroller with the DSP core here. And so this is a nice uh, demonstration of a technology and um, it's for an animal model. But it's a, it's a polymeric uh, cable here. It's a seven channel cable that went to the electrode array. And we moved, uh, instead of having an implanted receiver stimulator remote from the electrode array, we moved all the stimulation on the back end of the array. This is a silicon based device. So we leveraged the technology of making integrated circuits so that we could more precisely place the electrodes. So the current way, uh, excuse me, the current technology, all these devices are made by hand. Um, three, main three main manufacturers in the world and every, every manufacturer makes the electrode array by hand and the electrodes are placed in a mold and soldered. So this is a way to use uh, integrated circuit based methods so that you can make multiple, many, many devices on a single wafer. You can also dramatically scale down the electrode sites. What happens is um, you can scale down the sites. However, um, you have, you have, now you're, you're battling a little bit with a thin, thin, thin film. So it's, we have a thicker area here at the back end because we need to do signal transfer and you need something stiffer when you're bonding to the back end, to the leads here. But the thin portion that can go and spiral in the cochlea is only about, um, you know, this one is a 14 micron base, but it's probably about a four, a four micron thickness for the insertion portion. And what we did is we scaled down the stimulating sites 
dramatically and place them two to three times more closely than existing arrays. So this 250 micron space is at least um, twice as close. And so I won't uh, go through all the details here, but the nice thing about using the silicon-based technology is that we can make a shallow and deep portion. And when I say boron, it's just boron dope silicon. And then the beauty in that technology at Michigan is that the boron serves as an etch stop. So essentially it tells um, your EDP where to stop eating through the silicon and you can make uh, some really I interesting structures. So these devices are layered. So on top of the silicon we have metal traces, dielectrics for insulation, and um, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the stimulating sites here. Most all commercial devices are made of platinum and we move to iridium so Imagine if you scale down the, the electrode, let's move to the electrode here. If you scale down the electrode size, that's all the space you have to do these nice reversible electrochemical reactions that the electrode electrolyte interface in the tissue. So if you scale it down, but you still need to depolarize nerve fibers, then you're, you're challenged with improving the electrode electrolyte interface so we move to iridium oxide. It's, it's more challenging to work with because you need to activate iridium oxide, which means you need to build this anhydrous layer so you can have more valence transitions and, um, and basically do more charge transfer. So it's a little different. Um, now this is the electrode array that we tested in a guinea pig. And on the bottom here, I put uh, a representative commercial array so in terms of the area, we've gone down quite a bit from the iridium oxide, uh, excuse me, from the platinum to the iridium oxide. So once you do that, we wanted to see, well, are we, are we stimulating nerve fibers? And we did this in a guinea pig model, and we first did monopolar stimulation, which, does anyone know what monopolar stimulation is? A couple? A couple, yes. So one electrode site internally, so in the cochlea, and then a return electrode. So you need to have a return path in the animal model. So we found that we were on par with commercial technologies. So we wanted to benchmark our new method with existing methods. Bipolar, which makes sense, right? Two sites, two collinear sites in, in the... Um, cochlea. And what we did is we stepped through closer and we went further and further apart. And as you go um, further apart, it takes less current. So bipolar, while it restricts the field, it's a more energy hungry strategy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, oops, I guess I got to back up for a second before I go into my newer technology. So the silicon was great in terms of microfabrication. But in terms of putting any torsion on a silicon array, you'll break it. And does, has anyone worked with silicon arrays, neural nexus probes here? No. Well, you'll feel the, you know you'll know my pain if you've worked with them. So, you know, if you think of a planar, you know, it's a silicon wafer, and now you want to twist it and turn it. Oh, that's trouble. You can you know do a lot of in-plane stuff. So, still great for MEMS, not so great for electrode arrays that need to twist and torque. So once I came here, I was on this, this path to improve the electrode arrays. So we went to polymers because polymers are much more flexible, probably more challenged in terms of longevity in, in tissue. So we went to, um, uh, we, we started working with folks at uh, Georgia Regents Medical College of Georgia uh, because they wanted to start doing more research with their residents. So I said, well, let's try to make a polymeric array. And that's not so hard, but getting it into the cochlea is. So we looked for technologies or ways to introduce the electrode array into the cochlea. So on the top here, what I'm showing is a thin film array made of polyimid. And our first step was, well, you know, why don't we try to mate our array with existing methods, with commercial arrays? 
So Medel, um, a cochlear implant company in Austria, was able to take, these are non-functional arrays. These are two types, an insertion test device and an insertion electrode. So what they've done for us is, what they did for us is they gave us the silicone. In the top one, this is kind of a weird device and no surgeon uses it even though they make it. It has a stopper. It's to insert into the cochlea before you put in the real electrode array. Surgeons don't use those because that can introduce trauma and also via imaging, they'll know what the path is in, inside the cochlea for uh, placing the array. Nonetheless, we use that to try to, we use that as a vehicle. So we essentially glued our thin film arrays onto these two uh, silicone, silicone based devices. So <coughs> we had mixed results. And we introduced these into uh, human cadavers. So through either the round window or by drilling a hole in the cochlea. And so I probably should point out what you're seeing here because that may distract you. Um, this is the silicone from the, the carrier, those two devices they gave us. And what we did is we glued our array. Here's the gold. Those are, you can see the interconnect there. And this is an example of the array coming apart from the insertion device and penetrating the vasilar membrane. So that none of this is good. This is not how you want to go. So we found mixed results. Also, this is a bit strange is that we had unimplanted controls and 29% of them exhibited insertion trauma. So suggesting that probably the method of assessing trauma is a bit confounded if something that had no electrode array exhibited trauma. So we said this is probably not the way to go, but we need to bolster, we need to strengthen these electrode arrays. And so we thought about it and we said, well, you know, okay, let's just try to put some, um, let's just try to paint it with silicone so you can buy silicone. So rather than taking two pieces and putting them together where you know they're coming apart, just take the electrode array and coat it. Nicely coat it with silicone and see if that does the trick. And so this is an example of a really, really nice um, holder, I guess, to make, to apply the silicone adhesive to the thin film array. And I, I like to put this here because sometimes as engineers we get all excited and think, well, this is what the clinician needs. They need an array that's bent because the cochlea is bent. You know, the first turn, coming into that first turn. And so it's, it's fairly comical because here we are bending our arrays and thinking that'll help them and um, making this nice, pretty, you know, here's the silicone on the array. And I wanted to show this just to give you a sense of the interconnect, how we do the signal transfer, which is not really elegant, but gets the job done. Um, so when the surgeons inserted them into the cadaver, the human cadaver boat, they said, we can't put these in because they're bent. And we're used to dealing with straight arrays or having an, a stylet, which helps the array is pre-curved, but as they insert it, they pull on this stylet that releases the array. So they said, don't, don't, uh, don't, turn, don't pre-curl them for us. We, we don't like this. And, um, we had a, a, since these were resident projects, we had a new resident on it. So we saw a lot of insertion trauma. Um, we also implanted into a completely different structure. So we said, fine, we won't curl them. We'll just paint them with the silicone. And we saw very, very good results with this, with this uh, approach. We um, did this in the cat, so we were looking at a live prep to see how well we could depolarize auditory nerve fibers. We only saw one delamination, meaning that the silicone separated from the array. And to move along a little bit more quickly, the research or the experiment that we did is we first, uh, so this depicts at a system level or a block diagram level how we do these experiments. So we start with an intact auditory system and we apply acoustic input to validate that we are seeing a response. So we were measuring uh, um, the auditory brainstem response, which is something you can measure out externally. 
And then we come in and we damage the hair cells with uh, an antibiotic, the same antibiotic that can cause hair cell loss in humans. And then we came in with an electrical input. So we applied charge balanced biphasic current pulses, so the same amount of uh, charge you put in the tissue you need to take back out. And then we looked at the response. So number one, you want to get a response. So this is a representative auditory brainstem response. The first, you know, you see this big jump here. If anyone's done electrical stimulation, you see the stimulation artifact, and then you start really listening. So this is a triple peaked evoked auditory response. So number one, we saw a response. Great. And number two, well, how much current is it taking? Are we on par? And again, we, we did pretty well, 170 microamps. Commercial stimulators only go up to um, 2 milliamps, which is really, really high. So about, you know, three, 300 microamps is where you want to be maximum in terms of what it takes to stimulate auditory tissue. So those results were promising. Um, enough that we're, we're continuing to do this work um, with the thin film arrays. So let me give you um, a sense of what a thin film array looks like inside the cat cochlea here. So I like to show this because this is a micro CT image with 50 micron resolution. And you can only put you know, animal or extracted human. Uh, you, you can't do this with a human being uh, just because of the resolution and the radiation exposure. But I like to show this because it's extremely rare that you're going to be able to resolve electrodes sites placed 200 microns, 250 microns apart in a CT image. So this is, and this is available to those of you doing animal studies, it's at, it's at Emory. So they will allow us to access that if you want to image some fine structures. I'd highly recommend it. So what that enabled us to do was take measurements from, let me point out a few structures here. So this is the basal turn. And you know, if you have an electrode array, your target elements are in the medialis, the central structure. So we did pretty well during the implantation where we came close because if you're back away at the, at the um, lateral portion, you lose the benefit of high density because you have to you know, go so far in a way to stimulate the auditory nerve fibers that you're going to be spraying a lot of current into the cochlea and just a representative 250 micron spacing. So we could image the electrode arrays. Um, so moving on from the um, cochlear implant work, where we are continuing to look at improving the electrode arrays, is the vestibular biosystem work. And I think this is where we get the most translational, and I think this is some of the most challenging work to understand. So what we're after is um, looking at the vestibular system. So here's the cochlea, and here's the vestibular system. So what does our vestibular system do? Does anyone know? Balance. Balance. So a couple folks said balance. And I, I mean, I don't really think about what my vestibular system is doing until I'm dizzy one day. Um, so it's very much this low-key system. And the moment you have a deficit is when you really, really feel it. And it's, it's, it's different than the auditory system in that respect. And so we're looking at that both from um, an implantable way as well as um, external. So, you know, this is a very prevalent, so dizziness is extremely pre prevalent, 40% of Americans. And also in the aging population, this is a significant problem. And balance, you know, if you, if you have trouble with balance, you're going to walk slower. You're going to not want to do as much. And it really impacts your quality of life. And it's, you know, falls are, a, you know, a big problem in the elderly community as well. Um, so the, kind of the, the good news on vestibular function, and this is a lot of the work that I do with Emory, is that you can train the vestibular system to compensate, to overcome, to engage other senses, because it's very much a multi, multimodal integration for the vestibular system. So 
That's often if you have unilateral function, dysfunction, only one side. You can kind of get the other side smarter. But the bad news is those who have bilateral vestibular dysfunction, um, they have no therapeutic options. And so that's a vestibular prosthesis work that we do in our lab. So moving to the good news first is that this is an example of a series of exercises that a group, uh, uh, Susan Herman and Ron Tusa at, at Emory, pioneered. And that's where you can engage your uh, visual system to overcome a poor vestibular signal. And the nice thing about this research is that you can train individuals to overcome for this loss, to compensate for this loss. The challenge is, you know, although we say here 75% improve with gaze stabilization exercises, 25% don't. And their theory is that, well, 25% don't, but we don't know if they're just not doing their exercises. We don't know if they're doing their exercises wrong. And so we've developed a really simple uh, head motion monitoring device. So I come back to my MEMS roots and get to use, you know, accelerometers and gyroscopes and measure head motion in a really simple, low cost way. And we can get a nice signature, a nice profile of what an individual is doing outside of the clinic. So there's a huge explosion, really, of cell phone based, you know, vestibular rehab devices and all these different tools. But, you know, if you Take an individual who's 65 or 75 and you say, well, why don't you wear kind of the same hat that you would when you're gardening and, you know, just turn it on and do your exercises. It's very low cost. They're much more agreeable than if you hand them a cell phone or a tablet or something that is just too, too much for them. So we're after low cost and simple. And so we do have a clinical um, study on putting these, just this, hat on patients. The other thing is that it helps um, normalize uh, PTs because they routinely, they don't get this information unless they use this big, very expensive system that they can't send home. So moving to the case where there are individuals who need a bilateral, um, vest who have bilateral loss, we can develop a, a vestibular prosthesis. The vestibular system is different in the sense that hair cell loss so the hair cells are the transducers, but rather than modulating, you're not uh, stimulating place, you're modulating rate. So if we can capture external head motion, translate that into a neural signal, and apply that to the vestibular nerve in a position-specific way, position meaning how we are moving in space, then we can use a similar paradigm to cochlear implants to offset vestibular loss. So I'll speed up a little bit here in the interest of time. Um, and so this is an example of the peripheral vestibular system. These are the hair cells. And we have this amazing structure here called a cupula. So our semicircular canals that detect angular head motion in, our, in three planes, it's deflection based. So we have this nice diaphragm here occluding. So we have a canal. We have this diaphragm. And as we move, the fluid in the canal is an inertial element, so we move and the fluid lags and we bend these hair cells, we bend the stereocilia on these hair cells and we modulate the firing rate of vestibular neurons. So we just have a tonic rate at about 100 hertz and if we can kind of up modulate and down modulate that rate and the beauty of our system is we have two ears. so. We modulate, we can go up and down so we get, we can amplify the signal. And so what we've done in terms of looking at a vestibular prosthesis, there's two main challenges. And one is that when you have inertial sensors and you implant them, they're very power hungry. So what we did is we thought, well, how can we model this vestibular sensor as a MEM structure? And I'll skip over that a little bit. And so here's a representative semicircular canal. So this is a first order hydrodynamic model. And if we can get the same frequency response as well as deflection, we can use that to code the angular head motion instead of using a gyroscope. So our device is purely passive. And this is a little bit of modeling of it, but I'm just gonna skip to the MEMS piece um, 
so I can close up pretty quickly. So you can make a biomimetic semicircular canal using a diaphragm, and you can make that out of PMMA. We did this with um, Maxine McLean. And we can make an SU8 mold. So essentially, you're making a similar structure to the, to the semicircular canal. And you have the kind of the cupula. You have the bendable element here. And now you have to think about, well, how do I sense that? So it's a capacitive-based sensor. So once I deflect, so the capacitance changes, and you have a reference electrode. So you're changing, very similar to MEMS, a lot of MEMS devices, you sense a change in capacitance. Now I make it sound really easy, but it's actually not very easy to get the um, sensitivity you need because MEMS devices are linear. We linearize our world in MEMS, but you and I are not linear beings. So the cupula actually has a huge dynamic range, and it's, this is very much a work in progress. Um, I was hoping um, my uh, soon-to-graduate student would be here and he could talk a little bit about the signal processing aspect of that work. Um, so we do circuit design in our lab. So we pretty much do it all. We do MEM, signal processing, and a lot of circuit design here um, on building the vestibular prosthesis. And I'm going to skip through this just a little bit um, and talk about well, I think I just skipped through all the circuit work here, but I wanted to acknowledge um, the broad range of trainees that we have in our research group, um, gra uh, graduate students from Georgia Tech, as well as otolaryngology residents and medical students, which I think really enriches the work that we do so we can better translate that from the engineering domain to the medical domain, as well as I, I'm always really proud of the number of undergraduate students that have gone through our lab, because I've really made some impressive contributions. And two of these students um, are hearing impaired. Um, one is a cochlear implant user, and another um, uses hearing aids, and we have a sign language interpreter during our group meetings. So that's always pretty interesting for us to get that insight from these individuals. So I'd like to acknowledge the funding sources, NSF, NIH, as well as, as, well as MedL, Cochlear Implant Company, a lot of donations for us, and close with the overview slide of how our group tries to integrate as much engineering as we can to meet uh, the need in sensory neural and vestibular loss. So thank you. Any questions? Chris. So the cochlea seems like a really constrained environment, Ryan, compared to skulls and you work in those two. The auditory nerve would be a much less constrained environment to try and work in because not all the cases are above. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work. Um, House Air Institute was really pi pioneering that. And so they're using thin film technology in implanting the auditory nerve. So while it's a less constrained environment, the surgical approach is more difficult. More the surgical approach, getting to the auditory nerve, um, is a bit more difficult. So are you talking about in the periphery, or are you talking about further up in the auditory chain? Because So in the fear colliculus, we actually have the frequency to place mapping in terms of these layers. So they're doing inferior colliculus. They're implanting in the inferior colliculus. They were hoping to see a better resolution of frequency as well as lower the threshold because in the cochlea, you brought it. You, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You're you're constrained. You're you're not targeting the neurons as well as you could. They have not seen that. 
they have not been able to drive drought, you want to drive down threshold and you want to improve resolution. And on both counts, they haven't seen it. Um, I'm not sure why they're not resolving that um, as well as they would like because they're implanting directly into the nerve or into the inferior colliculus. Um, they're not getting the resolution that they need. Did you have a comment? Yeah, a question. Oh, oh go ahead. Um, sort of branching off this, you mentioned this earlier, this idea that some patients respond better than others. Mm -hmm. Some might respond better to improved peripheral implants, but maybe more central implants farther up the auditory pathway would help. Could you comment on like where you envision these implants going, or given what we know about auditory stabilization? So I think ideally, the further you go up the pathway, the less you have to do in a sense because there's levels of integration as you go up the pathway. The challenge there is the surgical approach and the current paradigm is the closest place that you know you can activate the neurons, the auditory nerve fibers, is where you go. So individuals who don't have, so you may have a um, acoustic neuroma on the vestibular cochlear nerve, so you can't conduct that information though, so they try to implant further up. Um, I think that as well as you try to improve the periphery, if you can't improve it in higher auditory centers, you do have a loss. But I think people are much more afraid because, you know, I'd say 200,000 individuals are implanted with a cochlear implant. Surgeons understand them better. There's a lot more data on them. And so I think that's why, and there's, it's so expensive for a company to take on the liability. And I think that's why we try to mine the heck out of the periphery because it's less invasive and it's safe. Um, but that's an important question because it's perception ultimately. So that's a really important question. There's a lot of NIH funding in hair cell regeneration. Uh, there's stem cell approaches. Um, it's mixed. Uh, there's a few groups in the country doing some really novel work. They have been able to regenerate hair cells in birds. Um, some work in mice. But that's a very, very active area because if you, can revi if you can revitalize that population, that's really what you need. But it must be going on all the time. These are using hair cells all the time, right? Are they, are they getting regenerated normally? I don't think, someone recently told me, actually, they recently told me that they heard a talk about hair cell regeneration, but it was not, it was in a mammal, but not in a human. So we are losing them for sure all the time. We are, I know that we're, we're, we um, promote the neural population, but in terms of hair cell, the sensors themselves, I don't think that we regenerate them. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So, if you look at the um, the cochlear electrode array, we deliver 833 pulses per second. So, you know, all that fine timing information is lost. And MedL has a most sophisticated, uh, most sophisticated signal processing paradigm where they do. I think it's. I can't remember the name of the filter design, but. That's why people are also going after bilateral implants because we hear through two ears and, and we need that timing information. So a lot is lost. A lot is lost. But we can talk more. I, I, it, it's easier if I show you a picture. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You're going to extract it really painfully, but it's 
how does that profile, that aggregation profile, I mean, it's kind of goes back to Dr. Rizal's question, I think, of selectively trying to isolate spatial regions. Um, how do you envision that actually affecting those reporting threats you say that, or, or, the, or what the searches would be? So those recordings are, um, how do I say this in a good way? So the best way to map a different stimulation paradigm, those recordings are monopolar-like. So the, I can envision adding more spectral information to those recordings as you improve the activation. Meaning that if you can do bipolar stimulation, ideally you should be able to um, more, like having a tighter filter as well as more um, ban more bandpass filters. Now this is not what you see in patients though because of the integration. Because if you do research in animal models and compare monopolar with bipolar information, bipolar uh, stimulation, and if you stimulate in the cochlea and record in the inferior colliculus, which has a frequency to place mapping, you will see, if you look at the spatial tuning curves, they will be tighter for bipolar, tripolar, they will. But if you take a patient and you apply monopolar and bipolar, most patients prefer monopolar. Although if you look at the profile, you are being more restrictive. One reason is that the implanted electrode arrays today are so far from the neural elements that the patient just really needs to get a broader activation for perception. So that's a really important question without a good answer yet. So I have a counterpart who's at UW who's doing a lot of research on tripolar stimulation and in patients who are poor performers, it helps, but not in the good performer. Tripolar just means you're using three collinear electrodes and you have a really a much tighter spectral, a much tighter peak in the stimulation waveform. It doesn't, because for speech, um, I mean, the sweet spot is about three, 300 hertz to about a kilohertz. Right, and I just wonder, yours is narrower than that, I bet, right on the... Yeah, the yeah, the because the array right. is shorter, but they play these games. Um, there's so much work that's been done on how you can and how we can adapt. So what they'll do is they'll move. Although the sound we hear has a specific bandwidth, they know that that's not what they can stimulate. So they play these games of shifting it down. And that, and it works. And that works even better for the patient. Yeah, but I wish I had an audiologist here because it is an art. I mean, audiologists are amazing individuals. Surgeons put it in and they're kind of, you know, I'm done. But the audiologist is the person who fits so the patient. So it may not be our standard audio frequency band. It could be totally different to give them the best interpretation. Wow. Hmm. Oh, last question, Chris. We're trying very hard, yes. Yes. <laughs> and are you thinking that you would implant that or you're using that for testing purposes? So what it is, is it mimics our system, but we would never penetrate a semicircular canal, canal and put it in there. So it's a model, it's inspired by biology, but it's an inertial sensor. And it would be implanted, but not replacing, it's not like a, a bionic cupula or something. Well, so, that, so why would you not take that sensor that you're building and test it in an artificial cupula, but then insert it into, into a real semicircular canal or something? Well, why, why do you have to build an artificial one? So if you could insert it and uh, couple that, if you could insert it without compromising, 
the semicircular canal, it would make sense. But the, you can't really like open them up and put in this, it's not like a retinal prosthesis where you can put it in and close it back up. If you penetrate the semicircular canal, you can't surgically, you know, fix it up, if that makes sense. So that's, I talked about that way in the beginning of my work and the clinicians looked at me like I was nuts, so I gave up. So. <laughs> so. Have you personally shifted to the vestibular work more than the auditory? So auditory is my first love. Vestibular is a strong need. So I try to kind of <laughs> mate the two. You can see how I ran out of time when I got to the vestibular, but that, because the vestibular is so much harder, but much more exciting. I mean, my clinical work is in vestibular. And my auditory work is more basic science -y neural interface. But I'd be happy to stay and answer some questions for, the, for those who want to stay. But thank you. I enjoyed this. Appreciate it.